Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks to you online, wherever you are in whatever time zone. So uh, I'm excited to tell you this story, uh, which is one uh, I lived through. Um, the advantage of being a senior academic is that you can tell stories that seem like yesterday to you. Uh, my guess is when the, most of this occurred, which was in the late 90s and early 2000s, evidence to policy wasn't exactly on your your uh, the for, foremost on your learning agenda, uh, but here we are. And uh, the uh, even though I'm going to be telling a story that happened to some extent in the past, is still very live now. And in fact, uh, you know, they say that history uh, repeats itself. Um, actually, what it's doing right now is uh, is rhyming. And if you open the pages of the New York Times or Twitter recently, you've seen, I guess this is up to me to press uh, this. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yes, you've seen uh, these headlines. There's a heated debate going on right now about the uh, evidence behind uh, masking policy. Uh, this is just a commentary on on the in the New York Times that cited a review by the. Oops, see, I went backwards. I'll figure this out by the end of the, my talk. Okay, that. Uh, yikes, this is live. Okay, that featured this review by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is going to feature uh, prominently in the conversation about mammography. Um, and there, well, this just. I'll get it. Um, and uh, this uh, has uh, uh, provoked a Twitter firestorm um, of criticism uh, related to transparency and uh, assessment of the quality of the evidence. We're going to see that this is ex that the roadmap for this was set uh, and mirrored in the mammography debate, and still continues in that way. And here's the uh, Twitter uh, discussions, and there are many of these. Many, maybe some of you are aware of them. And we're going to see, see this playing out. In, over the next few days, weeks. And the other dimension of this, of course, that uh, is shared with the mammography is the intense politicization of, of, these, uh, of, of some of these conversations. So yes, uh, I'm gonna be talking about something in medical policy, but you're gonna see that um, the political sphere uh, was very much uh, involved. Now, this is uh, an assessment of the quality of just one of the studies that was part of the masking debate. And this is one by Abeluk, and it was held in, um, done in Bangladesh um, with over 360,000 people, but it was cluster randomized, so it didn't have that many uh, actual units of information. But you see here, and this is part of the Cochrane Review, the, uh, the assessment of quality, and you see these various dimensions of quality that are used, the potential for bias, and in the author's judgment, almost every dimension of quality that they assessed was high risk of bias. The only one that looked good was the random sequence generation, but allocation concealment, blinding, blinding outcomes, outcome data, selective reporting, all these were rated as poor. We're gonna see a mirror of that in the mammography story. So if you go onto the US Preventative Services Task Force site today, you will see that they are updating their guidelines. Uh, they are updated every few years. So this battle is rejoined on a very, very regular basis, roughly every five years, and it explodes into the headlines. And you will see that the parameters of this debate are very, are, are, are very echoed in almost every other realm of what I'll call evidence to policy in medicine when the calls are close. And I'll just read you one sentence from this. It says, the task force keeps recommendations as current as possible. And it says, the task force uses gold standard methods to review the evidence and it's transparent at each step of the recommendation development process. I will leave it to us to think about whether the transparency leads to consensus and resolution. Let's see. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the future. This is a book that traces the debates in, uh, uh, in mammography and other issues related to breast cancer that I will say have been going on uh, effectively forever. These, what I'm gonna be talking about is just some intermediate chapters, but again, it reprises every few years because uh, the evidence changes, people's values changes, change. So here are some of the players. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of um, 
uh, official bodies, individuals, evidence uh, assessing organizations, professional organizations. It's a very complex ecosystem that we exist in. I'm going to be focusing mainly on a debate that occurred between uh, investigators from the Cochrane Collaboration and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is an entity uh, whose home base is in the CDC. So the warm-up is this 1997 consensus panel that was held at the NIH. I'm not going to go through the uh, details of that. This is the report. Uh, this is actually the program of that. I was there. Um, and this was the final report. It doesn't seem that uh, devastatingly controversial. They said the data currently available do not warrant a universal recommendation for mammography for all women in their 40s. Each woman should decide for the, herself whether to undergo mammography. It should be based on her own, uh, uh, on the evidence and her own values. This uh, provoked a lot of press coverage. This is from the New York Times. And you see here um, uh, the, uh, an opinion piece. And then there's also a news piece on the left. I can just tell you this got a lot of coverage. Ah, uh, This is from Science Magazine, the breast screening brawl. What happened was that the uh, president, uh, the, the, the director of the NCI, got very exercised over this and said he would immediately convene another panel, the National Cancer Advisory Board, and they would meet and uh, get, give their assessment of the evidence. Uh, the Congress weighed in on this. This is a letter to the chair of the National Cancer Advisory Board, a colleague of mine who is actually the only breast cancer survivor on the panel, also an epidemiologist, ultimately the only one to vote against the recommendation of this panel. And this is um, uh, from Kay Belly Hutchinson, who is a senator from Texas, saying, uh, you know, I was disturbed by the recent findings of the of the uh, conference panel, we hope you'll do a better job. More telling is this letter from Arlen Specter, Senator from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, written to the head of the NCI. I'm not gonna read the text of the letter, but basically said, if you don't reverse those recommendations, we're cutting the budget of the NCI. He says it in slightly more politic ways, but uh, the message is extremely clear. Uh, so again, a lot of press um, and a lot of controversy. So this now is the, Tear the ring into which the Cochrane and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force enters. Meanwhile, the, many of the doctors, there's a radiologist looking at a mammogram. Let the statisticians argue. They're saying their expertise trumps anything that the methodologists have to say. Uh, and the politicians also know the answer. This is an inquiry, uh, a Senate hearing, and we hear here from Barbara Mikulski, Senator from Maryland. Uh, I believe that mammograms do save jobs, uh, do save lives, and women. Uh, should know when to get them. And from Kay Belly Hutchinson, it's deja vu all over again. Um, everyone in this room knows that by early detection, we've saved lives. So uh, this was not a, um, the, these are not, uh, these evidence reports are not entering in a neutral political landscape. These are the seven studies that were the grist of these uh, uh, um, evidence reviews at the time. There were four from Sweden, one, one of the earliest and largest um, uh, randomized controlled trials of a preventive service ever, the health insurance plan study from the 1960s, which continued to have tremendous uh, relevance or uh, weight all the way in the 2000s and even to today, and uh, two from Canada. And that was the most recent. So I'm just going to hopscotch through this, uh, and we'll see in the discussion uh, which aspects of this you most want to elab uh, deserve elaboration. These were the, this was the dimensions of quality assignment of the Cochrane Review, uh, and you saw that also echoed in the uh, mask assessment. They, they uh, said it was um, a, the study would be of, of high quality if all three criteria were satisfied. Actually, I think I didn't have the criteria here. Let's see if I can go back, back, no. Um, okay. Uh, there we go. Now it's going forward just a second. Yeah, so these are the dimensions of the Cochrane critique. Number one is adequacy, the randomization. Two is post-randomization exclusions. And three are cause of death attribution, which are uh, sort of generic to um, all RCTs. You can apply this to everything. So let's see. And this is how they ultimately judge whether it was high quality, medium, uh, medium or poor quality or flawed. 
these are the seven studies and you see the verdict they, they, they there are ratings of each dimension at the end of the day only two studies were rated as medium quality and those were the two only two that were allowed into the um, assessment that is very very important so this is the assessment on top of the are the two it's actually three because Canadian studies were divided into two uh qual the the three high quality studies and you see that the cluster of effects is around zero and the four studies they rated as lower quality had an effect of 32 percent uh reduction in breast cancer deaths so this this quality assessment was actually absolutely central to their assessment that um uh, mammography did not work Okay, and this is the display of the effect of mastectomies and lumpectomies of of, uh, of mammography, and this actually was something that the Cochrane was putting on the table really for the first time in these uh, discussions, and this also played a big role. So now we have the U.S. Uh, PSTF uh, criteria for mammography. Uh, you will see that they sort of mirror the Cochrane's, but they use slightly different language, initial assembly of comparable groups, their maintenance, and whether they're assessed fairly at the end. Uh, this is how they summarize the, uh, the group, the various criteria into uh, good, fair, and poor evidence. And it's slightly different than what Cochrane does. Um, at the end of the day, they basically said that the violations have to be severe to throw out a whole body of evidence. And they said that most of the things that Cochrane found are legitimate, but not enough to throw out a whole study. And so at the end of the day, they said, including uh, five of the seven studies, they, they, they threw out two for various reasons, that the effect of mammography is a 25% reduction in mortality, different than the 0% that Cochrane said. Um, and for women in their 40s, where a lot of the controversy was focused, they said there was a non-significant 17% uh, reduction in mortality. This is the, there's a formal grading system for recommendations by the US PS, PSTF, which is a function both of the quality of the evidence and the size of the benefit. And you can see the grid here. Um, and these, these uh, A, B, C recommendations translate into actual language. Um, this is the language that it translates into it. A grade A recommendation translates into the task force strongly recommends. B is they sh clinicians should routinely provide the service. C, no recommendation. D, recommends against. The uh, buy in uh, every two year screening of women over 50 got a B recommendation. So that was actually not an A, it was just should provide. And the uh, for women in their 40s, it got a C recommendation. That is uh, no uh, uh, recommendation for or against. Um, now, one thing to just point out is when we talk about policy, what is the policy and whom is it aimed at? And there are many, many entities. And the it's is it women? Is it the insurers? Is it the is it guideline developers? Is it policymakers? Is it the doctors? And for each of these you might want to look at the evidence base in a different way. So, and now there's new evidence because we don't have any more. There's just one more uh, randomized trial. But what we're trying to do is take advantage. Of it. None of these use modern technology, modern treatments, modern methods of assessment. So to these RCTs, we're now having to add modeling. And what is shown on the right is the different use of different chemotherapies. And on the left is the percentage of women who are having mammography and, and the different colors is the frequency with which they use it. And everything is changing in real time. So seven groups were empowered to do modeling. This is right up the right up you guys alley. And this is a, um, we have here our representations of the different models in mirroring the, the rise and then fall. The, there's been a decrease of in breast cancer mortality over the last two decades, and this was trying to see how much of that is due to better treatment, due to screening. And in the box there, you see the different percentages that the various models um, have attributed to uh, screening by itself. And it goes all the way from 7% 7, uh, 7 or a 28% reduction, all the way up to a 65% reduction in these different models. Um, in the meantime, many groups have been working on recommendations. The, this is a bewildering list. But the most important thing, I don't think I have a pointer here, is to look 
at the direction and strength of the recommendation. And you will see we have lots of discuss and offer if chosen in favor, in favor, in favor. This is these groups. And then we have Canadian Task Force suggest against, suggest against, suggest in favor. They are all over the map, particularly for women in their 40s, even with all the evidence being out there. This is a piece I wrote, and I am finishing up, uh, that captured what I think are the salient issues, particularly for this conference, and they're still true today. And I'll just quote from myself, because when I sit down and write something, I actually say it coherently. Um, I said, the controversy shows that the justification of why studies are included or excluded uh, can rest on uh, competing claims of methodologic authority that look little different than traditional claims of medical authority that we actually thought we were getting rid of with evidence-based medicine. Some may argue that this is exactly the kind of debate in which the explicitness of transparency uh, shows its value. The problem with this is that every scientific methodology has foundational assumptions, which are in this case about how to assess quality, how to, about, how to combine it and which things to, and how to incorporate quality. And that's exactly what was being contested here. So transparency, did not solve the problem. And I won't read the, my last thing. Um, so judgment determines this and uh, we should have to be aware that we can't get rid of judgment even when we're being very explicit. So what were the problems hi highlighted by this debate? Role of judgment in developing the criteria and applying the criteria, incorporation of quality, the role of non-RCT evidence, which has come up more frequently, the balancing of harms and benefits and the differences between policy making bodies. And here we have history rhyming all over again. I predict we're gonna see every one of these factors played out in this debate as we're gonna see it uh, uh, roll across our, our Twitter uh, feeds and on TV over the next uh, few weeks and months and maybe years. So thank you. <laughs>